Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to First County Council this 25th day of January. I'd like to call our meeting to order. If everyone could please bow their head for a moment of reflection. Thank you. Read our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that First County is situated on the traditional land of the Ananasha Bay, who have a long standing relationship with the land and water throughout the region. We honor and respect the history, languages, and culture of the diverse indigenous, Batias, and Inuit people who call this territory home. As a county, we have a responsibility for reconciliation and a continued stewardship of the land on which we live and work. If you have pecuniary interest, you can disclose that now or as the meeting moves, moves along. We do have an additional item to our agenda, and I'll let Tyler tell you about that. Perfect. So through the warden, the addition is item 7.3. It's delegation on item 8.2.1, OPA number 213, and item 822, Milverton, OPA number 12, and that's William Miller. Okay, so we have a motion that item 7.3, delegation item 8.2.1, PA number 213, and item 8.2.2, Milverton OPA number 12-William A. Miller, and that the January 25, 2024 agenda be approved as amended. Deputy Warden Kellum, second by Councilor Aitchison, all in favor? Carried. Okay, we have 12 items on our consent agenda. Is there any item anyone has any questions on or would like told? Other information, Councilor McDermott? Uh, yes, 6.3. Uh, I'd like to uh, pull uh, and uh, send a letter of support. Okay, any, anybody have anything else? Another one? Go ahead. 6.10 um, <coughs> from uh, Sudbury about uh, what an employee is. I think that would be a uh, a letter of support to Sudbury and to the uh, whichever provincial government uh, department that it should go to in our MPP. Okay. Um, that could have serious consequences for us in the future if somebody got hurt on one of our projects. Okay, anything else? Councillor McKenzie? I believe it's, um, I think it's 612, 611 and 12, I think are pretty close to the same. It doesn't impact us as a county so much. As it does uh, the lower tiers and, and some of the local churches, and a lot of them are struggling with regards to uh, cemeteries and you know, keep up them on one thing and another. I just I don't think it would hurt for us to support that resolution. Okay, anyone have anything else? So that council receives a consent agenda. Excuse me. Consent agenda items 6.1 to 6.12, excluding 6.3, 6.10, and 6.12, and approve the January 11, 2024 council minutes. Like Councilor Smith, second by Councilor Orr. All in favor? Carried. Okay, so we'll go back to 6.3. You would like that we pass a motion to support. Correct. Do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think it would be. Uh... Excellent that if uh, people could get some training before they show up and look for a job, that, that would uh, that would help our roads department uh, immensely. Okay, you're moving that, Councilor McDermott. Councilor Kassenberg seconds it. Any more comments or questions? All in favor? Okay, and then the other item, six point ten, Councilor McDermott. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <clears throat> Just could have severe repercussions on our on our municipality if somebody were hurt on a project, and uh, even though there's the paperwork there, that they would still come after us. So I think that needs to be clearly defined in, in formal law. Okay, so you're moving. Yep. Motion to so move by Councilor McDermott. Do we have a seconder, Councilor Orr? Comments, questions, Councilor Aitchison. I'd like to direct the Public Works comment on this. If possible. John? Thank you. Through the warden, uh, this involves a superior court decision um, with the city of Sudbury. I believe it was a public works project uh, where somebody was killed uh, uh, on site. Um, 
I do know there was a, I believe it was Good Roads that sent out a heads up alert with this, just so that municipalities and staff are aware of that. Uh, I have sent since uh, Luke Danette into the equation here, and she's done some research and she's keeping tabs on, on where this goes. Okay. Further comment, I have no problem supporting this whatsoever. But I looked at that or read that, and I thought that kind of it's kind of like our roads. Somebody gets in a bad accident, and for some reason they got to sue the county or the lower tier township because somebody was hurt or killed, even though that wasn't our fault. We still get sued and we still pay. So I'm just kind of wondering where this might end up going. Okay. Anyone else? All those in favor of the motion? Okay. Okay, and 612. Walter, do you wish to add anything more? Yeah, I would need um, just a case of, of circumstances and the way the day, today's day or today's times are. Um, group of not necessarily even rural, but happens a lot with the rural churches. Uh, membership dwindles, uh, manpower dwindles, and then uh, first thing you know, no, what do they do with the cemetery? As of right now, it comes to the municipality. So we've been getting a few of these, um, and some come with with some funds, and some come with no funds. But you still have to look after it. So I I I, I think it would be worthwhile supporting this resolution. Okay, so you're moving that. So I will we'll do that. Mackenzie, second by Councilor Kassenberg. Any more comments or questions? All in favor? Carried. Okay, we're moving to delegations, and we have three delegations this morning. And our first delegation is uh, North Perth Seniors, and we have Vince and Jennifer joining us. So, if you'd like to come up to the table, <laughs> welcome to County Council, and the floor is yours. <clears throat> Oh, I guess normally we let the ladies go first, but uh, I'm delegated to talk first. So thank you very much, uh, Council, and appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, present our our situation with the North Perth Seniors. Thank you very much. You should have or will be getting a copy of everything that, that I have said and that will be said by uh, Jennifer. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer uh, McDonald, who is uh, with Warden Upper Grove, and she represents us throughout the whole year as our accountants. And back in the back there is a couple more uh, members of our of our group. Uh, the president is Carol Charles, and she's there. And the treasurer Judy Weaver, and our media past president is uh, Jim Barron. So they're sitting in the audience judging us, I guess. So if I could get started, it is our intention today to request that you restore our funding to its original amount of $8,000. We will justify this request by explaining the organizational activities, function and community benefits. Our accountant will explain further following our report. The North Perth Seniors, which has successfully thrived for 35 years, is an organization dedicated to the citizens of North Perth and the surrounding areas. We are over 50 years of age. Its aim is to provide activities, social networking, and potential resources information to its participants as well as members. Included in our regular programming is our popular weekly dance and live music, our annual Christmas banquet, door prizes, <coughs> trips, various presentations. Many pertinent organizations such as the VON, the OPP, have presented valuable information to our group regarding additional local social events like yoga, Meals on Wheels, and the various exercise programs. A presentation outlining how to recognize frauds tar targeting seniors is planned and is of particular interest to our members, and that's coming up next month. We have maintained membership fee 
and event fee, along with additional fundraisers, such as our annual auction, weekly buy at 50 50s and draws, et cetera. However, with our mandate to remain cost effective for a population of fixed income, we find we need the combining finding funding of the county as well as the province in order to contribute our this service to our 2,210 members, as well as our additional attendees. Regular attendance often is 70 to 100 people every week at, the, at our get-togethers and dances, and it provides this valuable, thriving organization. When you invest in our seniors organizations, you will also be investing in other county council previews. Keeping seniors healthy and connected helps to keep hospital beds free and improves the overall health, which in turn decreases the stress of Perth County health care and related systems. The North Perth Seniors Weekly Dance provides regular cardiovascular and mobility exercise. In Canada, 87% of older adults do not meet the government regulations for exercise. Our organization provides the excuse to exercise. Now, if you're looking at the notes, if they're there or will be there, there's some other things that just are referred to uh, in publications about the importance of activity for seniors. So in summary, I just want to say, and, and as active participants in the electoral district of Perth County, our seniors, have been and continued to be contributors to what has become our great county of Perth. North Perth Senior Center is welcoming area arena, elevating connections and our well-being. When seniors are healthy and feel a community connection, they, they give back. Many of our members are active in the community, serving on volunteer committees for additional uh, with additional county and organizations. This helps us to ensure successful funding functioning of various Perth County activities. Thank you very much. I think if there's any questions at the end, certainly I'd be pleased to answer them in regard to the operation of our organization. So I'll turn it over now to Jennifer uh, and she will give you the financial situation. All right. Uh, thank you, Vince, for the summary of the program activities and community benefits the North Perth Senior Center provides. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm Jennifer McDonald, a principal with Warden Up the Road. I've been with the firm for over, or, yeah, just over 10 years now, um, and worked with many nonprofits and charities over the years. Uh, Warden Up to Grove started working with the center in 2004. According to our records, the County of Perth grant started in July of 2005 for $8,400. The County of Perth continued uh, the $8,400 annual payment up to 2017. In 2018, to avoid a ministry clawback, the funding was increased to the now $8,880, which was approved and continued to be paid annually until 2023. The center receives um, provincial funding, and as a condition of this funding, it has to follow the 2017 Seniors Active Living Center Act legislation. This legislation states that no payment shall be made to an approved operator with respect to an approved program, but the operator will maintain and operate in a, municipal, uh, in a municipality unless the council of any one municipality directs payment to the operator of the sum equal to 20% of the net annual cost to be approved to the approved operator of the maintaining and operating the approved program. So for the 2023-24 fiscal year, the municipality funding has been decreased to $2,500. The required provincial funding has been set and approved at $26,200 which puts the 20% requirement at $5,240, meaning there's a shortfall of $2,740 currently. By decreasing the county's funding, it's not just causing the $6,380 funding decrease to the center. If the current funding requirement is not met, the center's provincial funding will be cut back to $12,500. This will, re will result in just over 2,000, 
$20,000 in lost funding for the year, which would be a third of the total revenue this annually. The funding must be restored by the fiscal year end of March 31st, 2024 to avoid this happening. If the funding levels are not restored to the previous level levels, it will cause significant shortfalls and will result in activities being stopped as the center will have to arrange repayment of the provincial grant. For 2025 and future years, if the funding is not restored, the center would not be able to operate in the current form. All the money the center raises is used to fund its operations and provide these programs to seniors in the community that Ben spoke of earlier. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions of the presenters? I'm sure. Just wondering what the membership fees are. Uh, Five dollars. And what uh, does does not Perth Council give to this? <laughs> um, and correct me if I'm wrong, what was $2,500 the maximum limit that we were able to give to any organization last year? Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Deputy Warden Fellow? Yes, sir, the Warden. Thank you for your presentation and coming out today. Um, realizing, kind of bouncing off what Council Orr said, it's called North Coast Seniors. It's a county gathering. Mm -hmm. Roughly, could you tell us how many from whether it's West Perth, East Perth, South Perth, North Perth? It's just, it's, it's not North Perth residents. Yeah, no. Um, just, I, I can't give you a number of how many are outside except uh, take Milverton, for example. I know that the Gilberts, I think everybody knows them, probably the best dancers in the county. Uh, they come in and they bring a lot of their friends as well. There's a crew from Mitchell that come up and they bring their friends too. And some, a lot of times it's to deal with what music you're providing. Uh, I know, um, I'm trying to think of his name that comes regularly, uh, Patrick Satchel Sage. Randy Satchel. Yep. Well, yeah. when he comes, yeah. when he comes, you know, everybody comes from down the, and he's from down around the Mitchell area. So, it's a it's a quite a mix of reasoning. So um, yeah, and they're even coming from outside uh, our, our boundaries as well. So we'll take their membership dollars no matter where they're from. <laughs> Thank you. That that question you asked there's of two hundred and eleven members last year, uh, they started to sell the memberships for this year. And the membership committee is already at 135, I think it is, just for this year and for the month. So it's it's a growing deal. Yeah. I'm sure. Have have you ever gone to the lower tiers to ask for funding? No, this is kind of go back to um the original agreements that were worked out with, as I understand it, with the province and their um, and their criteria and so forth. And it was saw uh, at that time, the, the way to go was to work with the minister, with the uh, uh, county. Okay, anyone else? Dr. Richardson? Just out of curiosity. So I haven't really seen a financial statement. So how much money would you raise in draws, membership, et cetera, without grant? Well, just multiply 200. And 11 or whatever it was by five. That's that's a amount right there. Uh, the you got to add on the money we raised with the auction, which has been quite successful in uh, in fall in conjunction with our Christmas supper. Um, everything that we do, there's a, a certain amount of it. Like the bus trips example, we get a portion of the bus trips that money comes into us. Um, the 50-50 draw, you may think that that's nothing, but that does bring in every week. So we have all those various things that bring it in. The total amount, I have to ask the treasurer back here. Or do you have I, some? I have some rough numbers, um, and these are kind of skewed. I have pre-COVID numbers just because the last couple of years have been um, a little inconsistent. Um, membership range has ranged from 1,000 to 1,500, um, and then fundraising years has gotten up to 11,700 from our records. And then total operating expenses would be ballpark how much? It's, uh, 
for our treasury. She didn't have any of this. Okay. You know what, uh, Al? How much the uh, overall budget is? I can guess what I know it is. Is that? I said you go ahead and guess. See? I can see. Eight thousand. Good time. Okay, Tyler says he has some numbers, so. So through the warrants and the information that was supplied by the organization in terms of source of funding uh, for the budget, uh, their grants uh, totaled the amount that was mentioned, the $29,970 from the province in 2022, uh, the 2500 from the county. Uh, with respect to fundraising, 50-50 tickets was $4,320. Admission sales was $19,200. Membership fees was $1,050. And then other was 1,000. Uh, with respect uh, to some of the other information, um, if you'd like, I can provide the numbers uh, for <laughs> the project budget. If you'd like that, Vince. Yeah, go ahead. That'd be okay? Okay. Uh, the venue, uh, $3,600. Uh, newspaper advertising, $1,632. Insurance, $900. Uh, printing and supplies, $350. Uh, snack and prizes was 5,000 for the project budget. Um, understanding the caveat of the programming uh, with respect to music would be uh, fluctuating depending on who is coming for the music. So that puts that in summary, I believe. Okay, okay Councilor Orr. I'm sorry, one more. Do you have any staff or is all volunteer? Yeah, we have a coordinator, part time, part time, full time, you might say. And coordinator, and there's a lot of the arranging of everything and contacts made for just booking the bands is a simple example, and uh, arranging for the lunch that we do serve every. It's not an elaborate lunch, but it is uh, something for them to hang around and talk after whatever functions we've got going. Yeah, so there's a lot of little jobs that she does. <clears throat> okay. Any more questions? If not, I do have a motion. I'm not sure if anybody wants to add to it. It says the council receives the delegation 7.1 on item 8.4.1 operation operating budget North Earth Senior Center. So we're receiving for information. We're just receiving it for information right now, yes. And then we, we are doing the budget process. Uh, we will um, be working on the budget later on in the meeting, and it could be brought back up there if someone wishes to. Or it can be given direction to be looked at at the budget too. Here, whatever you wish. <clears throat> We're just receiving it for now. Yeah, that's what I yeah. Receive it for information, Councillor Orr. Second, Deputy Warden Callum. Any more comments or questions? All in favor? Carried. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Thank you again. Appreciate it. Okay, next item on our agenda is the delegation for OPA 213, which is item 8.2, the Milverton OPA on our agenda. And we have Caroline Baker and Caroline's coming in in the screen. There she is. Morning, Caroline, and welcome. And the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, Warden Agates, uh, members of oh, County just Council. Just give us a second. Oh, it's a bit delayed here. All right, try now. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we're good. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Caroline Baker from Baker Planning Group. I'm here this morning on behalf of uh, the numbered company, uh, Mr. Jeff Bateman, and the two official plan amendment uh, applications. Um, if it's acceptable, could I share screen? I've got a brief uh, presentation to take through. Yep, we can see that. Perfect. Great. Um, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to delegate. Uh, certainly this application was before you uh, last spring uh, for the statutory uh, public meeting uh, to consider the two official plan amendment applications. Uh, in part, this presentation, uh, just to provide um, a bit of an update on the nature of the application and also to respond to some of the comments uh, and questions that we've received from uh, members of the community uh, and trying to provide some further detail from the comments we heard from Township Council uh, that was held uh, December uh, last year. 
Uh, so certainly uh, Mr. Bateman uh, is there uh, in person uh, this morning and if possible uh, was uh, registered just to provide a two, few comments uh, after me if there's uh, hopefully enough time. Uh, there was a comprehensive uh, team uh, putting together the applications, including engineering, traffic, natural environment, uh, archaeological, and as you'll see later in the presentation, an acoustical engineer. Uh, just as a refresher, uh, the subject property is located uh, on the south end of uh, Milverton. It's around 11 hectares in size. Uh, it's sort of bordered on the north by residential and the existing recreation complex. And then to the south, uh, there is the existing Rod and Gun Club, as well as the Percon uh, Industrial Development uh, further to the south. Uh, this is an overview of the development concept. Uh, certainly the project team in working with county and township staff uh, looked to provide uh, land uses that met the needs of the community consistent with provincial policy and the draft county efficient plan review, but also to ensure there was compatible and a transition of land uses. So certainly this graphic is uh, rotated. So on the right side of your page would be the north where the recreation complex is and to the left side of your page or the south would be the Rod and Gun Club, uh, and then certainly the Percon development. What you'll see is 72 uh, residential lots, a mix of singles, uh, semis, and street townhouses. Again, optimizing its location next to existing residential and the amenities available in the community. In pink, what you'll see is two small, what we would consider neighborhood commercial uh, uses uh, to support this growing community. And then further to the south, a stormwater management pond, uh, two light industrial blocks, and then about 35% of the site uh, is uh, taken up by an existing uh, wood lot uh, that of course would continue to be protected with the associated buffers. I believe you'll hear later on on your agenda this morning from Mr. Bannon uh, related to the applications before you. There are two amendments. Uh, the first is a county official plan amendment uh, to bring the property into the settlement area. While there's existing permitted uh, industrial use permissions on the property in the official plan, it was never formally brought into the settlement area. So first and foremost, it's to bring the land into the settlement area. It's also in keeping with the draft county official plan that was released in December. Uh, that document does rep um, recommend that this land come in as well to the settlement area. The second official plan amendment is to the uh, Milverton Ward official plan. And this is to ensure that the appropriate land use designations uh, are implemented for the various land uses. So certainly residential, highway commercial, industrial and natural environment. Uh, should the official plan amendment uh, applications uh, be successful, uh, there is associated uh, zoning bylaw amendment applications and a draft plan of subdivision, uh, but those would come back at a later date uh, with specific uh, draft plan conditions. In terms of comments that we've heard uh, since the public meeting, uh, working with staff uh, on the report, uh, primarily relate uh, to some servicing and grading, uh, as well as uh, noise concerns related to the uh, Rod and, and Gun Club. What this graphic shows is the preliminary grading plan prepared by MTE. Uh, certainly the site does need to be raised uh, to address both sanitary and storm water. Uh, we have been working uh, with MTE and hope to continue to work uh, with the township to minimize the fill as much as possible and look at uh, some design revisions to minimize the need for any retaining walls on the property. Uh, further to the comments uh, received from the Rod and Gun Club, uh, the owner did retain um, SLR Consulting, acoustical engineers to prepare a noise study. Essentially, this study uh, looked at the noise source from the Gun Club and was particularly focused on the proposed residential uses within this new uh, development. Uh, the noise study was completed with all MECP uh, requirements and the NPC 300 guidelines. The residential or proposed residential use is just under around 300 meters uh, from the Rod and Gun Club, uh, separated uh, by the woodlot. The study did conclude uh, that the residential can be accommodated uh, in considering the MECP guidelines. Uh, there will be a need for 
uh, items such as a noise warning clause, uh, double glazed windows, uh, and some height restrictions on those buildings, which of course are included in the associated uh, zone change application. We did hear comments at the uh, township uh, meeting in December, uh, some concerns about ongoing complaints from new residents uh, about the Rotting Gun Club and the impact it could have operationally on the gun club in the future. We did have an opportunity since that meeting to look at some case law uh, with respect to complaints filed uh, by sensitive uses such as residential for surrounding uh, noise sources. Uh, what the general conclusion uh, looking into those case studies was that uh, the municipality uh, would generally not be liable because they are not emitting the noise source. Further, the gun club, uh, in consideration of the study, is in compliance with the proposed residential uses. So they are within the guidelines uh, that the ministry publishes for residential uses. Uh, certainly, uh, that provides some clarity uh, with respect to noise uh, moving forward. So just a quick summary, uh, certainly uh, we're in support of the county planning staff's uh, recommendation uh, to approve uh, both official plan amendments. As noted, the draft uh, county OP uh, that's before you uh, this year uh, does recommend inclusion of these lands uh, for development. Uh, it was identified as a need in the Watson uh, housing study to bring additional housing in to the settlement uh, area. And in terms of impact on surrounding uh, agricultural uh, MDS was completed to ensure no negative impact, and this would represent filling in the hole between the current settlement area and Percon uh, to the south. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, it's our opinion that it is compatible, it's consistent uh, with the provincial policy statement, and certainly represents uh, good land use planning. I would be happy to answer uh, any questions uh, now or in at a later point in the agenda. Um, I can stop sharing this presentation. Okay, thanks, Caroline. Any questions? She'll be back for the OPA, right? Uh, are you sticking around for the OPA, Caroline? Yes, I will be here. Okay. Okay. If no questions, we do have a motion that council receives a delegation 7.2 on item 8.2.1 on OPA number 213 and item 8.2.2, Milverton OPA number 12. Caroline Baker, owner of Baker Planning Group. Moved by Councillor Tinko or Kassenberg, second by Councillor Tinkowski. All those in favor? Okay. And my brain didn't get rewired when I was away. <laughs> okay, so our next delegation. Uh, thanks, Caroline. Our next delegation is uh, from Bill Miller. So, Mr. Miller, if you'd like to come up and uh, table, please. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Gordon, Councillors, uh, thank you for your time today for the opportunity for the Dover District Rock and Gun Club. The club is a nonprofit organization. It's uh, now been in existence for 58 years, servicing the community. The club currently comprises of 179 members from business owners, engineers, laborers, and professionals who utilize the facility. For our, uh, we do archery besides firearm usage in the range. We're an approved facility by the Firearms Office of Canada and the Firearms Office of uh, Ontario. In fact, we have, uh, our club is used as a model now for other clubs in Ontario for the professionalism of safety and the utilization of uh, training of individuals in the sport. These are the type of activities we hold at the club. Uh, you can see we work with youth through to uh, adults, and we have ongoing professional training of individuals in the club for the safe handling usage of firearms. We also do a lot of work for uh, non-members and profit 
organizations that were well recognized by the uh, Perth East Council for what we contribute to the area and the people living in the area. The issues that we see are noise with housing, and I'll get into that. We also see surface water removal that's going to degrade what we already have on the club. And we are looking at the community impact by including housing in this proposed uh, amendment. But before we get there, the club directors, owners are pro-development. We want to see Earth East grow. But we want to ensure that the development does not impact the established businesses who've been there for years. There is a win-win situation in here. There's a win for Jeff. There's a win for the properties bordering this. And then there's also a win for Perth East and the County of Perth, but we have to get there. <clears throat> we looked at the noise study and we find it incomplete. It does identify, identify that there's issues. It does identify some proposed solutions. But the solutions don't quite fit with the other plans that have been done on the property. MTA got a report on the property, and if you delve into the MT report, you'll find that they raise the base for houses two meters. That changes the whole strategy of noise impacting the housing. And the question isn't a, hasn't been answered for the noise for housing. What if you're sitting out in the backyard of some of those houses uh, during the operational period of, of the, the club? which is from uh, half an hour before sunrise to half an hour after sunset, seven days a week. How would you like to feel sitting in out there and listening to firearm noise? The study shows the raising of, of uh, land, a lot, of, a lot of the housing area, and then you mesh that with the noise study, and you'll find the noise study is incomplete in addressing whether there's an effect or there's not an effect on the club. That's what we have on our property. We have an area of, of land that is a uh, swamp. That whole woodlot is listed in the county of Perth as environmentally sensitive. And in fact, the report prepared by, N by NRSI talks about some species that are on the endangered list. And since our woodlots are joined, and the construction report from MTE is removing the surface water the area, there's nothing been established that this does not impact the swamp area and impact what we have as a natural habitat and some of the species that are listed that are on the endangered list. Community impact. I happened to take a look at the Watson report. And the Watson report is clearly what the county and Perth East is operating under. And within that Watson report, it indicates that presently in the village of Milverton, 
there's an excess of land for housing even in 2048. The other thing that you can look at, when you look at it, this is the existing plan on the Watson Report of Milverson. When we're looking at firearms noise, firearms noise can be created anywhere outside that perimeter. Province of Ontario allows hunting. So what we want to be able to come to a a consensus on is being able to solve the noise problem and solve the water issues. Currently, Mornington Ward has a bylaw that was enacted by the village of Milverton that protected the club from noise issues within the current village. Once you include this proper property proposal and the rod and gun will be inside the village of Milverton. That changes the whole aspect of noise being a potential issue. Basically, that bylaw that protected us becomes null and void. At the last Perth uh, East Council meeting, the representatives of the constituents of Perth East voted down this proposal. What was uh, also stated by a council member that he was in full support of the club and wanted it to continue to stay there. It was also stated at that council meeting on record that Perth County will make its own decision no matter what the constituents of Perth East want. And that I'm concerned about. There is a solution. To get to that solution, we need the involvement of the county, Perth East, and the developer together. If there's a decision made to go forward within housing within, within that area. There is plenty of opportunity for other needs of commercial development within Melbourton and the Mornington Wharf that is sorely needed because of the housing that we've already put into Melbourton, the servicing of that housing and meeting those needs of servicing that housing is going to evolve into millions of dollars. And I think the focus should be on <clears throat> development of commercial and industrial. That's it, well. Okay, thanks, Bill. Any questions from members of council? Councilor Smith? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> presentation. Love for me, Jerry. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah me too. Um, just to answer the one concern you have about the, the noise, Report it's not complete. It's incomplete. It's incomplete. The um, noise, if you read through the report, it's based on the present land level of the land that's all currently there. However, MTEs report on how they're going to rebuild that area to service the sewage and water. They're raising areas six meters. And if you read the noise report, they're looking at adding the inclusion in some of the second stories of the uh, how proposed housing. But when you raise the land six meters, you raise the foundation of houses six meters. So you change the whole level of impact of the noise towards, towards those houses. And what they does, doesn't address is on those houses, if you're out in your backyard with your kids or having a barbecue with your friends, doesn't address that at all. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? 
Oh, okay, then council, we have a motion that council receives delegation 7.3, excuse me, on item 8.21 official OPA number 213, item 8.2.2, Milverton OPA number 12, uh, William Miller. Moved by Councillor Orr, second by Councillor Aitchison. All those in favor? Thanks, Bill. Okay, we're going to move on now to staff reports. And the first one is the Coyote Predation Program. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you, through the warden. This is an information report for Council. And um, in the fall of 23, Council had had a discussion about um, coyotes and the, the uh, potential um, uh, problems that they, they have in the rural communities. And uh, so this information is drafted in uh, two sections. First on the OMAFRA program, which is the Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program. And uh, as council is aware, that, that is a process for livestock operators to be reimbursed for injury or loss of their livestock due to a predation uh, occurrence. And the livestock evaluator is involved in that. And um, those are processed through your, your local municipal offices. And I did include the key aspects of that OMAFRA program, just for your information. And uh, the use of the OMAFRA program uh, is set out in the report. And there are low numbers across uh, Perth, just uh, to point that out. There is information uh, if council did want to proceed with a coyote predation program, there is some sample language that could be included in a program uh, should council deem there be a need in Perth. Uh, it would uh, amount to a financial incentive to hunt problem coyotes that are directly responsible for a coyote occurrence. And I did meet with the local CAOs. We did have a discussion about the need for it. And um, there was a consensus there that the numbers at this time uh, do not warrant a regional program, but uh, that they would like to see it listed at least once a term, or if there is a significant rise in the occurrence across the county, we would bring that back to the table. Um, there was also a consensus that uh, we could have communication staff meet across the county, as they do, to discuss an education program that could be scheduled for the release in the fall of each year, and that would be looked at as proactive action to protect uh, livestock and pets. And the sample, um, put some sample information in there in terms of language that could be, or steps that could be in uh, a program. If council was wanting to look at a program now or in future, we certainly would be bringing back um, a, a sample bylaw for consideration because uh, council might want some uh, changes to the process or changes to what would be the recommendation of $100 a coyote pelt. Um, it would be limited. There'd be a limit uh, of 10 coyotes per kill. Um, we would set an initial budget of $500 uh, and then look at averaging that cost um, over a five-year period once you get to that period. And um, I did look at uh, other programs um, in uh, Huron, Bruce, Duffering, uh, Great County, and uh, the thing to note about this particular program, now this only focuses on coyotes, but you could include wolf in there as well, um, any predators, if that was council's desire, um, but it doesn't apply uh, to dogs. If, if there was, if this is for livestock and there is a, a direct uh, connection uh, to the OMAFRA program, and the use of the livestock evaluator to be able to say, yes, you have a problem here. And if you, there is legislation at least, um, and um, stand to be corrected, because I'm not, I'm not a hunter, um, but um, you can't just go out and kill as many as you want, um, that we would put a limit on it and that you need a license to go out and uh, hunt these types of animals. And there are also, uh, all the programs that I looked at indicated that uh, there would have to be verification when the um, hunters come in to be paid. They would have to bring, I think, about an inch of the top of the ear. Um, that's what's in the other programs as well. So this is just information for council. Happy to take any direction that you have. And if there are questions that I need to uh, go follow up on, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay, questions on the report, Councilor Aitchison? Good report. The slight little issue I have with this report, it only refers to claims for livestock. 
Yes. I get umpteen calls a year from people whose dog, pet, was just cleaned by a coyote. And that's why I was the one that raised this issue. Okay. Councilor Orr and I raised this issue last fall. And I'm getting all kinds of people still phoning say, a coyote just got our family pet. There is no place you can phone and say, hey, my family pet just got destroyed by a coyote. There is no reporting on that. But we really don't know. That's why I raised the issue, and that's why I still have a little issue. Yeah, there's very few livestock that get reported. Most livestock are predominantly indoors now, so they don't necessarily get a chance, the coyotes get a chance to clean them off. They might if it was a beef beef lot or something where, you know, calves are born out in the pasture or whatever, but uh, you're never going to see big numbers in livestock. The problem is they're getting more into the residential type stuff and cleaning off pets and whatnot. That's that's kind of why I raised the issue and I still have a little bit of an issue with this report. Mr. Kassenberg? To, to build on Councillor Aitchison's comments, I wonder if we shouldn't consider uh, as a, a, a sort of tentative uh, dipping of the feet into this one, uh, creating some kind of uh, messaging about a hotline that people can call or an email form on the county's website that would collect information about this because I too have heard from people where coyotes have killed their pets and, and that's quite disconcerting because it means of course they're getting closer and closer um, to real human activity and, and that's a serious concern I think for all of us. So um, I'm wondering if in, in considering a resolution we might tack in either a further report from staff or if staff is amenable right away. And I know that's sometimes a lot to ask. Um, we consider um, uh, moving towards some educational messaging with a phone line and an email or a web form that, that we can address this through. Okay, well, uh, certainly through the warden, um, that would be part of the education program. We could easily put something in that uh, allows uh, the community to report either to the local level or to the upper tier. We would probably um, have that so it's streamlined. So, um, you know, like a hotline or uh, the collection of the information. And then we could annually look at that uh, when the CAOs meet. That's where the information comes from is the local level. But without that information, and you, you are quite right, there is nowhere to report that. So uh, that would be um, totally fine to do that. And in um, other locations where um, staff have worked, we have dealt with um, coyotes through education programs. Um, and you can deal with it somewhat um, if the um, local levels, animal control bylaws recognize um, uh, sick and injured uh, wildlife. Um, because often uh, coyotes will have mange, and then generally it's dealt with through your humane society. But certainly we could um, discuss with the local uh, communication staff. We could set out a program for it uh, with um, the opportunity to report. And then we could look at that uh, when it comes back. Councilor? Just for clarification, then these four other counties, they already have programs in place? You're on Gordon, yes. Those are the samples that I looked at. Okay, so I'd like to move this one for information. I would potentially then like to have a bylaw looked at, but I really would like to have Councillor Duncan in the room. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want to receive for information and defer? Uh, sure. I'm happy with that. Okay, so we'll receive it for information and we'll defer it to a later date. Well, okay. on a later date. Well, it could be the next meeting. I don't I, uh, want to do it for the next meeting. No, I just, I don't think we want to just keep pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off. One of these days, and, I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to repeat the comment made to me by a rate pair. You're going to wait till a child gets chewed up by a coyote or you want to do anything. That was a comment made to me. I'm just repeating it. Well, the ministry and knows. it will happen at some point in time. I know in the bigger cities used to have foxes coming in. They thought, oh, they're lovely to look at. And all of a sudden, some of the children were being attacked. It wasn't so lovely after all. But should we be contacting the ministry? The ministry does track uh, coyotes as well. They track it through 
the deer hunters. So they, when they have their deer hunt here in Perth County, they have a questionnaire to fill out. And that's one of the questions they ask how many coyotes they saw. So the ministry is tracking this and they are working on it. So should we be contacting the ministry and seeing what they're doing? This is more their belly wax and all. I'm not a hunter. I don't know how it works. I just know I have a hunter with a, a bow hunter with a cam in my bush. He's always commenting on how many coyotes are walking by that camp on a continual basis. All right. Thank you, through the board. And so I did reach out to the ministry and I didn't get a response um, in order to include some of that information in this report. So I'm happy with the deferral. And uh, I will reach out to the ministry again and see if I can have an individual come and speak to council on that. So. I've got no problem with the deferral, but what I'd honestly like to see is <coughs> on our lower tier websites and even the county website, if we could put a little portal on there and say, and you know, through training and education, say we have a spot. If you've had a problem with a coyote, please report it so we can get a more accurate handle on what's really going on. Mr. Kassenberg? So if I might, I think the resolution is that that um, in terms of consideration of further programming, uh, we are deferring a decision until additional information is gleaned, but that we also believe, and so maybe by resolution, that, that we should implement an educational uh, initiative that includes um, a means by which our constituents can uh, reach the county and report uh, kind of sightings. Or the lower tier. Yeah, that would on all our websites. I mean, I, I think it, I, there is wisdom, I think, in a single point of contact on this one, though, um, Councillor Richardson. So I, I do like the idea that, that the county would be or provide a phone number and uh, a web form, and there's one way to do it. And I think that's an improvement in terms of efficiency. So, Mr. Smith? Yeah, so, so your comment about the reporting. I am a hunter, and our group gets 80, 90, 100 every season. And that's our group. Um, there's neighboring groups that also get the same amount, but they don't. They don't have to be reported. Um, the, the deer hunt, as the warden mentioned, you report it if you've seen any. Um, perhaps you, you are allowed to shoot them during the deer hunt. I know our our gang group does not, but yeah, that's the only reporting. So you might say report two or three, and you report when we, when the gang gets 80, 90, 100. You don't have to report. So during the conversation in the ministry, that should be brought up as well. There's got to be a bring up a way to report that. And once they see, oh, there's that many being being uh, shot, that th we do have a problem. Thank you. And that's just your group. Yes. Okay. So what do you want the motion to say? <laughs> been typing away here. Maybe you can give us an answer. Yeah, so through the warden, what I've got here is that council receives the coyote accreditation uh, program report for information, and the council directs staff to implement education and communications on a reporting mechanism for coyote settings within the county, and the county defer decision on potential bylaw to a future meeting of council. Okay, that captured it. Moved by Councillor Kasselberg, second by Councillor Orr. Any more comments, questions? All in favor? Carried. Okay, now we're going to move on to planning services and uh, 8.2.1 official plan. I uh, must apologize to Mr. Bateman. I did not give him an opportunity to say anything when we had Caroline on the screen. Is there anything, Mr. Bateman, you'd like to add before we uh, bring up Mr. Bannon? Good morning, Gordon, council members, staff. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to get in here today to speak to you regarding a new subdivision proposed at the end of Temperance Street, running down to Regional Road 61 with a new access from uh, 131 that would go into the subdivision. Uh, it was about this time of the year, three years ago, when Bill Geese and I stood at the end of Temperance Street and looked at that Pew property. Uh, Bill thought I should buy it as he was already developing on the east side of Milverton. And after reviewing it several times, doing some rough layout drawings, I sat down with David Pugh and bought the property and signed the deal in March. Now, I knew a substantial amount of fill would be required to bring it up to grade, to fill a new snow, you know, to drain down to a new stormwater pond, 
And this is the reason the property sat for quite a while due to the cost of the fill that would be involved in this. I started working with Cameron Moffat from MTE uh, Consultants in Stratford on the engineering side and Carol ba Carolyn Baker from the Baker Group in Stratford as my planner. Both companies have been great to work with. They've worked in Milverton and the Perth area as well. I ended up talking to the Milverton planner at the time who told me there was a need for more housing and suggested I take a look at it. So uh, the area I purchased, as you know, was zoned light industrial, but we felt with the playground, the baseball diamonds, the swimming pool or the swimming pool and the rink and the rec center there that it would just make sense for a two or three minute walk to be into a playground. So that's why we went ahead and looked at the, uh, the residential lots, commercial, and then the viability of industrial lots at a later date. So we completed all the studies uh, for the property development and even a noise study that was asked for by the Milbert and Rod and Gun Club. We did the noise study using SLR, SLR consultants and uh, on a day picked by the Gun Club. We did raise the, the standard, the stand up so that the noise was at the new level is where we picked it up. So that part was done. We passed the, new, the noise study with a, a few design changes to the houses that we will go in basically windows uh, and things like that. The bush, by all far, by all means, is the, the best buffer that's there. And uh, so I sat down with uh, Aaron Hanoff from SLR, and I said, what about a fence? What about putting something up? He said, no, won't make any difference. He said, the bush is the best buffer you have. I sat down when we were contracting, and they did Bill's work over on the east side to get an idea of what we're looking at for the cost of fill. The graded... Uh, for, for housing in that. Uh, the cost is uh, unbelievable. If I was to put 12 industrial lots there is about all I would be able to get. They sell for roughly 200,000 a lot. That won't cover the fill. Okay, we're up to put three and a half million dollars to put the fill in and grade it and compact it. That's not servicing, that's not roads, that's not a stormwater pond, a sewage pump system or a turning lane, okay? So after you put all those setbacks in on top of that, uh, we looked at it, residential made the only sense for that area. Now, taking into consideration that townhouses, semis and singles would be a good blended mix. And if allowed, maybe some of the singles that are facing the semis, if I could narrow them to 40 foot lots, we could uh, add a few more lots and probably lower the prices, keeping in mind trying to lower the overall price of a new home. Um, I was driving around Trussler Road the other day and. There's a big development going on just before you get to Ottawa Street. And they had a huge billboard up there. It says 40 foot wide premium lots. So narrower lots are out there. And I think that's what people are looking at nowadays with the amount of land we have and trying to, I'm not saying condense so much, but trying to keep the affordability down. I think everybody knows that the price of materials to build a home has gone up three times in the last three years. It's a 300% increase in price. So it makes it pretty hard you know, to put a, a cheap house anywhere you want, but they're still building million dollar houses on 35 and 40 foot lots in, in uh, Kitchener. So with the, you know, the province calling for more homes, uh, I think it would just make good sense to uh, let us go ahead with this residential. Uh, the way things look, we wouldn't be selling lots for uh, till 2026, probably. <laughs> By that time, Bill Geese, property would be developed and read homes on the north side, the way those fellows work, I'd be very surprised if they were almost done. We'd be coming in after that, and uh, I think it would work good. Uh, I lived in Milverton for over 10 years with my wife. We raised our family there. I think it was good for us. Uh, I started a few businesses, hired a lot of people from Milverton and the surrounding area, and all good guys, all good workers. Uh, my daughter still lives there. She married a good boy. <clears throat> Anyways, thank you for consideration. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bateman, and my apologies again that we no, no, no. and you have got sooner. Any questions from members of council for Mr. Bateman? Yes, sir. No. Oh, okay. If not, then we'll have uh, Jeff come up, then he will make the presentation for uh, official plan 213. Jeff, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. So as you know, Caroline Baker has submitted this application on behalf of 1803018 Ontario Incorporated. 
and they submitted applications for an official plan amendment to extend the Milverton settlement area to include the developable areas of the site, and then a separate official plan amendment to designate the lands as residential, highway commercial, and industrial. The zoning bylaw amendment has also been submitted to rezone the lands in accordance with the plan of subdivision that is being submitted through the application. The property is abutting agricultural fields to the west, the Perth East Recreation Complex to the north, single detached dwellings and commercial to the east, and the Rod and Gun Club and the Woodlot and the Industrial Subdivision to the south. Next slide, please. Subject lands are designated as Agricultural Special Policy A. Urban Fringe Natural Resources Environment in the County of Perth Official Plan. That official plan regulates the expansion of settlement areas. So the County of Perth is undergoing a review of the official plan, as you're aware. The policy directions report was completed in 2020 in order to provide population projections and the land needs assessment for the County of Perth. That report at the time recommended that subject lands should be included within the urban settlement boundary. Amendment to the County of Perth official plan is intended to bring the subject lands into the Milverton settlement area and redesignate those lands as serviced urban area. A separate official plan amendment to the Milverton Ward official plan intends to designate those lands as residential, highway, commercial, and industrial. And the Milverton Ward official plan does not include specific policies or designations for areas of environmental significance. So the applicant has suggested that a site-specific residential designated designation is placed on the woodland areas of the site, which would prohibit development in those areas. And that policy would be consistent with the County of Perth official plan, natural resources environment designation. The proposed development includes a mix of residential housing types that are located to the north of the subject lands to ensure compatibility with the existing residential area and to separate those proposed uses from the Milverton and District Rod and Gun Club, which are to the south of the lands. The submitted traffic brief has identified that the development can be serviced from Perth Road 131 and the extension of Temperance Street. Industrial uses are appropriately separated from the commercial and residential uses, and they're located on the opposite side of the stormwater management block, and the lots are appropriately sized to accommodate the industrial development. Next slide, please. The subject lands are adjacent to an agricultural area and the official plan amendments intend to expand that settlement area. As a result, MDS is required under the provincial policy statement. So one of the guidelines, number 12 of the MDS document states that reduce MDS one setbacks may be permitted provided there are four or more non-agricultural uses, residential uses or dwellings closer to the subject livestock facility than the proposed development applicant has submitted MDS calculations that show that the MDS setback reductions that are being requested are appropriate in this case. The proposed development provides housing options that will meet the needs of the current and future residents in the rural area. The provincial policy statement recognizes the protection of natural features in areas, and the applicant has submitted a scoped environmental impact statement, and that report was peer-reviewed. Findings of the scoped environmental impact statement include recommendations for mitigation measures and monitoring that will be included in the design of the plan subdivision, the subdivision agreement and with industrial site plan approvals. So the report concluded that if the recommended uh, measures are followed, then the proposal would not result in any negative impacts on those protected areas. Next slide. Applicant is requesting that the subject plans be rezoned to facilitate development of the proposed plan subdivision. My apologies. The, the subject lands are zoned agricultural, future development and natural resources, environment zone two. The applicant is proposing to rezone those lands through the rezoning application to a residential medium density R2 zone with special provisions to allow for reduced lot frontages, lot areas, side yards, and minimum distance separation to a residential high density R3 zone with, with provisions to allow for reduced side yards and increased maximum lot coverage to a natural resources and RE2 zone to an institutional IN zone to a highway commercial C3 zone with a holding provision and an M1 zone with a holding provision. Holding provisions are intended to be in place until a land use compatibility study and a scope traffic brief are completed to assess the site specific proposed use on the property as part of a site 
plan process, approval process. Proposed zoning that includes reduced yard requirements, increased lot provisions are intended to allow for more compact development that meets the density targets of the official plan. Applicant is recognized that the highway commercial and industrial zones permit a wide variety of potential uses, which could vary, have great impacts, very greatly on the impact and compatibility. And they propose that a land use compatibility study is required before the holding provision can be removed, to allow for development on the commercial and industrial lands. Next slide, please. So through the circulation, we have received comments back from our, uh, uh, sorry, the township's engineer, Enbridge Gas, Maitland Valley Conservation Authority, and Blue Water Recycling Association. Those comments have been included in the report. Through the public consultation, we have received a letter of opposition from the Milverton and District Rod and Gun Club and a petition that was signed by eight resident area residents. Concerns have been, have been identified and a response provided in the planning analysis of the, of the report. So some of those concerns are for noise and compatibility concerns. This has been an overwhelming concern that we've heard. Um, and it's in relation to the Milberton and District Rod and Gun Club and in relation to the proposed development. So an environmental noise assessment was submitted and that assessment concluded that the noise attenuation from the berms and barriers are predicted to be insufficient in order to mitigate noise impacts from the gun club. The noise report recommends that no noise sensitive spaces will include windows facing the general south and west directions on the second story of lots 14 to 37, lots 41 and 40, and blocks 42 and 44. So if windows would still be allowed on the east and north facades of those noise sensitive spaces on the second story of those dwellings. And with inclusion of window design restrictions, the noise reports note that development is expected to be in compliance with the model sound levels from the gun range. A detailed study is also recommended once massing and design of each lot has been finalized, if they do intend to include any noise, or sorry, if they intend to include any windows on the second story of those noted lots. The report also recommends noise warning clauses and agreements registered on title for each applicable dwelling as noted in the report. Subdivision agreement would include provisions for those noise warning clauses and the recommended window restrictions. Drainage is another concern that was raised. The applicant has submitted a functional servicing report and preliminary stormwater management report as part of the subdivision application. The consulting engineer for the Township of Perthes has reviewed that submission and, and has confirmed that the drainage and grading and servicing can be addressed through the detailed subdivision design. Environment was a third concern. Uh, a scoped environmental impact statement, as mentioned, has been submitted. The findings of the recommendation provides for mitigation measures and monitoring that would be included as part of the design of the plan of subdivision, the subdivision division agreement and the industrial site plan approvals. The report noted that wildlife is being protected by the buffering of the natural area and also the placement of the stormwater management facility and the placement of the industrial blocks and keeping it, the residential development away from that gun club noise. The locational buffer provides for additional separation distances from the residential area and the human activity that threatens potential wildlife. Permanent fencing is recommended between the development and the the natural area and homeowners brochure is to be included in the subdivision agreement, along with detailed lighting designs, which will be provided at the detailed design stage of the plan of subdivision. Directional lighting is to be provided for developments that are within 30 meters of the natural features. Development is also intended to maintain pre-development flows to the wetland and ongoing monitoring of that stormwater management facility is being recommended. The subdivisional agreement will include conditions to implement those findings of the scoped environmental impact study. As the report concluded that recommended measures are followed, then the proposed development would not result in any negative impacts to the protected areas. As for traffic and safety, a traffic brief was submitted by Traffic Mobility. The study concluded that all study Intersections are expected to operate in acceptable levels of service during the weekday peak hours under future total conditions. Study also identified that the left turn lane may be warranted exiting subdivision onto Perth Road 131. 
The study noted that impacts on the existing residential streets are considered to be minimal as drivers are expected to use the Perth Road 131 as the main connection to the new subdivision. And stop signs are being identified at intersections within the plan of subdivision. As for development costs and existing property access, the applicant is required to pay for the standard development costs associated with the development. Existing properties with road frontage on Perth Road 131 will maintain access to the highway. The proposed development is not expected to accommodate a second access at the rear of the existing dwellings, as the second access would create additional subdivision design concerns and re would result in a less functional traffic movements on the subject lands. But the lower tier, as you are aware, the uh, planning department did not have any concerns with the official plan amendment amendments and the zoning bylaw amendment. The Township of Perth East Council defeated the motion to provide a recommendation to Perth County Council that the official plan amendments be approved and the zoning bylaw amendment be approved in principle. And in planning's opinion, the applications are consistent with the 2020 provincial policy statement. They conform with the County of Perth official plan and they represent good planning. And planning staff recommend, it, recommend that Perth County Council approve both of the official plan amendments. I'm available to answer any questions through the board. Okay, thank you, Joe. Questions of the report? Councilor Cassander. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Ward Maggots. Um, first of all, can I ask, um, have you done a computation of the overall density for the residential area that is planned for development? I've noted sort of density estimates for the different types of housing, but I'd like that total picture in that area. Through the order, I don't think I have a density calculation for the entire area, but uh, the density yeah. provisions are 13.62 units per acre for the single detached dwellings, 26.9 units per acre for the semi detached dwellings, and 34.5 units per acre for the townhouse dwellings. I, I don't find that sort of yes. specified, sort of per type, as very useful in terms of making an impression about overall density use. Um, my apologies for that, that critique, but I, I find that uh, difficult. Um, can you tell me uh, in the block plan, uh, and I'm, uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, where is the stormwater management pond? Yes, uh, through the warden. So the stormwater management pond is directly to the north of the woodlot. Uh, and I think if we can bring up um, a copy of the subdivision plan, we might be able to show that more accurately. I think it's also included on the slide three, I believe. Oh, yeah. So it, it's in the block that is immediately to the north of the foot lot, um, just low street. Block Sorry for me to make out 50. here, but I think it's street B. Block 50. It's block 50. So we're going to regularly shape to block. Is that the one that we're talking about? Okay, thank you. So I don't know where that was. It wasn't clear. Um, one more question, Warden, if I might. Is there are, are there any clauses or guidance in the, the Milverton Ward official plan pertaining to housing affordability? Uh, through the warden, uh, in the official plan, the Milverton Ward official plan, I do not believe that there are any guidelines for affordability. Um, as we go through the, the process to update our county Perth official plan, there'd be those types of policies in, in that. And the, the Milverton official plan along with other township Official plans would be absorbed into that county of Perth official plan. Okay, I saw the, oh, the uh, Councillor Tunkowski go next. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Warden, through you. A uh, question, Give it a second there, Count Dean, it's delayed. All right, try now. Okay, thank you, Warden, through you. Uh, Jeff, one question. Um, in the delegation uh, earlier, there was a question raised about the interception of surface water um, and the lack of surface water affecting the environmental quality of the uh, the gun club property. Um, typically, the uh, Maitland Valley Conservation Authority would 
um, review that scenario and comment on it. Did did Maitland Valley Conservation staff uh, uh, express any of those concerns about uh, uh, degradation of the Rod and Gun Club uh, environmental uh, condition? Through the warden. So the conservation authorities have not expressed any concerns um, with the proposed development and the ability to maintain those flows. Uh, so the environmental impact statement did specify that they were to maintain pre-construction flows into the, the woodlot in that um, naturalized area. And those flows are going to be kept and that would be included as part of the subdivision draft plan conditions and the plan of subdivision agreement. Um, so that's included with those agreements. And then monitoring is also going to be recommended and would be included as a condition of that subdivision agreement to ensure that those flows are going to be accommodated. So it, th those <coughs> drainage and grading plans have also been reviewed by um, the townships engineers. And um, the preliminary findings have shown that they can accommodate those flows. And then a detailed design will be included um, as part of that subdivision agreement to ensure that those flows are maintained into those areas. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, if I may, Warden, one supplemental question. Um, Jeff, you mentioned a monitoring program to ensure compliance with those uh, maintaining the minimum flows. Will there be stipulated a remedial action plan if through the monitoring it's found that the minimum flows are not maintained what what's the what's the mechanisms uh uh what are the mechanisms available to deal with that scenario should it uh, happen in the future thank you through the ward and so typically this would be decided at as we bring forward a draft plan of some division um approval and recommended in those conditions you would typically include a condition that would ensure that there was either a financial backing to ensure that those works are going to be done if there if it wasn't maintaining those flows, or that changes could be made in order to accommodate additional flows into the subdivision. I expect that that will be taken care of through that detailed design, and there'd be some sort of financial holdback to ensure that that is being dealt with. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Smith. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone for reporting through the warden. So I think this is a great project to help get us to all those numbers of the province that we need by 2051. So uh, question, I guess, is about the noise study. Again, I asked um, um, delegation, uh, Mr. Miller, he seems to think that it's incomplete because of some changes in elevation and such. I'm not sure maybe Ms. Baker could help answer that. Do we consider the, the noise assessment uh, completed this time, or will there be some adjustments needed? <laughs> Through the wording. So, from a planning perspective, I, I'm not a noise consultant or, or noise professional, so I would rely on the, the reports that have been submitted. So, we have read the report. Um, we have not expressed any concerns with the, the findings in the report. So, from a planning perspective, as a planner, uh, we've accepted that report and we are not expecting any further changes to that report. Caroline, virtual. Okay, Caroline, would you like to comment on that? Well, thank you. Uh, through the warden, um, just further to Mr. Uh, Bannon's uh, comments, uh, SLR is aware of the proposed uh, grade changes and the increase uh, in elevation, um, and it wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't warrant any uh, changes or conclusions to the recommendations. It's considered as part of uh, the proposal before you today. Okay, Councilor Orr. Uh, great report. Uh, just wondering, is there assurances that the Rod and Gun Club can exist? Can we make sure of that? that down the line, they're not asked to close or anything like that? Through the warden. So um, I think that's a concern that was raised at the public meetings and at the, the previous um, meeting with the Township of Perth East. And I don't think anybody wants to see the rod and gun club closed. Um, so there, there's no intention in it of closing it or using this type of development as a mechanism to try to facilitate change in land use outside of that plan of subdivision. Um, so I, I can't give you assurances that the rod and gun club aren't going to close in the future. 
but um, everything is being done with the noise study and the recommendations and the requirements to notify any future landholder or residential um, um, the for a residential owner in this area, they should all be aware of um, the garden club being there. They're, they're going to have noise warning clauses included in the purchase and agreement sale when they're purchasing the property. Um, everything that can be done to notify them, including the homeowner's package, is being done to ensure that they're well aware of the situation and that there is going to be some noise outside of their building um, during the daytime as a result of the Rod and Gun Club. So they're aware of it. Uh, the township would process any sort of noise complaint the same way that they would uh, with any other noise complaint in the area, with the exception that there are other mechanisms in place to make sure that they're well aware of the situation. So in my mind, as a planner, I would feel that their complaints would probably be less justified as um, somebody else that has been living there for a long period of time. So there's residential development up and down for Road 131. Those noise complaints, if received, would probably carry a little bit more weight um, because they might not have been aware of the same situations and they don't have those same protections in place when they're purchasing the land as what somebody in this new plan of subdivision would. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Councilor. If I might just follow up on that, and, and I'm, I'm curious about whether the, the county staff has any impression about um, legal decisions that have been made with regards to noise complaints being filed by residents and whether from a risk management approach, um, the, the, the approach that's been recommended in this file is adequate to essentially immunize both county and the township uh, from legal action on, on this front. I, I don't know whether this is a question for the CAO or for our, our corporate solicitor at this point, um, but I, I think it would be an interesting question to have answered. Um, through the warden, so generally when you're buying a piece of property and it's registered on title, that you're aware that that noise is already there. Um, my, my practice would be, at least my experience is that would cover it. But I mean, we could follow up. Um, not, I'm not sure what else you could do in terms of uh, buyer beware. If they're made aware of it, and it's actually registered on title. So I think it's adequately adequately covered. Like I'm not sure. It's like somebody, and we had this bought by the ballpark, and then they complained about the ballpark. Well, yeah. it's it's there, right? So it's it's buyer beware, but we're going that extra step by having it registered on their title as well. So they should be quite aware of that when they go to purchase. <clears throat> Councilor McDermott? Uh, for some questions for uh, Carolyn through the warden, the MECP NPC 300, that's a provincial standard for noise and that could be changed at any time, correct? Uh, through the warden, that is a provincial standard. Um, certainly, I, they have been updated. However, the principles of uh, noise, the sound levels that are deemed acceptable for sensitive land uses, in my experience, since I've been practicing, are, are largely unchanged. Um, and what I would add is the, the separation, that is physical separation that's provided from the sensitive land uses being the proposed residential to the gun club is uh, around 285, 290 meters. And just for frame of reference, the MECP considers a class three industry, which is the uh, most significant form of noise emitting industry, um, typically uh, looks for in and around a 300 meter separation. Um, so just add the, the physical distance. I can't guarantee that the province won't necessarily change some of the, the policies, how you calculate, um, but the sound levels have remained, acceptable sound levels for sensitive sources have remained relatively unchanged. But they can be changed. The uh, the clauses that uh, you put in, have they ever been tested in court? Uh, through the warden, um, between the township uh, council meeting in December and the county council meeting uh, this morning, I think I'd mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, did have a review of certain uh, case law, so legal precedent in terms of uh, noise and cases with sensitive receptors. Uh, typically, it's where 
uh, noise receptor is found to be uh, in exceedance um, of the MECP guidelines. Um, that it can create a legal issue, but generally the municipality, um, as they are not the noise source, uh, was not part of those legal cases. And uh, we've seen in the report that uh, berms <clears throat> were not going to help with the noise. So berms aren't going to help with the noise. Um, not putting the windows on or the doors on one side of the house, I can't see how that's going to mitigate complaints. And talking to people in Milverton that live on the north side of Milverton, uh, they can quite plainly hear the uh, the noise from the club. And I know in many other gun clubs, that's what gets them closed down is noise. And whether you have agreements or not doesn't mean anything because anybody can take anything to court. And if you cut a sympathetic judge, and uh, question on the natural heritage lands, uh, where are they going to end up? Who's going to end up owning them? Uh, through the warden. So certainly with the upcoming uh, draft plan of subdivision, uh, that would be where that block would be created. Uh, we'll certainly work with the township on ownership, but the the current trend uh, that I've been seeing in, in my practice is there's a number of um, natural conservancy trusts um, that uh, have taken ownership of the significant features uh, to ensure that they are maintained as natural feature and continue to be protected. So it wouldn't be the township then that would be ultimately responsible for those lands? Uh, through the war in the township has uh, the option, um, but certainly there are other alternatives uh, in terms of organizations that can own the woodlot to maintain and protect it should the township not be uh, interested in acquiring it. It should be, and just to, uh, you talked about the Watson report, it should be noted that Perth East was the only municipality that's going to have an excess of housing. And uh, we've already changed some commercial industrial land in Wolverton to housing. We've created another 54, 57 units. So there's far better places to build houses in Millerton than beside a gun club. Okay, any other questions? The woodlot, I would donate to the Conservancy. Um, excuse me, Mr. Bateman. It's uh, the... So that will never move or change. Excuse me, uh, you cannot get up and speak. Oh, I'm sorry, I raised my hand. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. This is only council. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Any other questions from members of council? That, Councilor Duncan? No. Okay. All right. Well, we have a motion. We'll see where it goes. The council receives the OPA number two thirteen dash one eight zero three zero one eight Ontario Inc. Part Lot Six Concession Three Milverton Ward report submitted by Baker Planning Group. On behalf of 1803018 Ontario Inc., and that council approves the official plan amendment number 213 to the County of Perth official plan affecting lands described as part lot six, concession three, Milverton Ward, Township of Perth East. Moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor Ageson. Any more comments or questions? All those in favor? Opposed? It is carried. Anybody else count? And eight. So it is carried, correct? So yeah, there's only eight votes against it in America. And eight. Yep, yeah, carried. Okay, now we're going to move to our next planning item, and that is the Milton OPA number. 12, then Jeff. Yeah, so if you'd like, I could do basically the same uh, brief, but it's, uh, it's, it's the same report. So it's, it's almost identical. Um, the difference between the two reports is that one was to bring the lands into the Milverton official plan and the other one's actually to designate that official plan, so. Okay, any questions or comments from members of council? Not, then we have a motion that council receives in Milverton OPA number 
1803018 Ontario Inc. Part Lot 6, Concession 3, Milverton Ward, report submitted by Baker Planning Group on behalf of 1803018 Ontario Inc. And that Council approves the Milverton Official Plan Amendment Number 12 to the Milverton Official Plan affecting lands described as Part Lot 6, Concession 3, Milverton Ward, Township of Perth East. I need a move and a seconder, moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor Aitchison. Any more comments or questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, we've been at it for a little over an hour and a half. We're gonna take a five minute break.
Okay, we're back and we're going to move on now to corporate services. And our first is a forestry inspector's report and the floor is yours. Thank you. So through the warden before council is the December 2023 forestry inspector's report prepared by our forestry inspector, Marvin Smith. Uh, within the month of December, Marvin completed 21 inspections in response to the submission of a notice of intent or NOI and three inspections in response to request for a request from a landowner. If there's any questions, concerns, or inquiries, I'd be happy to pass those along to Marvin. Okay, any questions from members of council on the report? If not, then we have a motion that council receives a December 2023 forestry inspector's report for information. Moved by council or second by council McKenzie. All in favor? Carried. Okay, and the next item is the corporate services update and the net floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Um, before you is the report for activities within corporate services for December. Um, and prior to highlighting those activities, I wanted to just touch on the two delegations that occurred at Roma that fell under the purview of corporate services. Um, the first was with the Ministry of Transportation regarding school bus arm cameras and funding for AMPS. Um, our ask was that the government mandate and fund school bus cameras, as well as provide funding to rural and small communities for AMPS programs. Um, a special thank you to Councillor Kaysenberg for leading this issue. Uh, at the delegation, there was an acknowledgement of the issue and a deeper understanding of the inequities that exist between small and rural communities um, versus larger city centres that have higher traffic volumes that can fund the programs and, uh, greater, and access to greater resources. Um, there was also an understanding of the disentanglement issue, which just really is the fact that there's multiple levels of government that need to collaborate and work together. Um, on a very positive note, the Minister of Transportation offered to sit in on the, any of the technical meetings that may occur regarding this issue. And this delegation also included an ask from economic development, and I will defer to economic development to provide an update regarding um, their delegation. The second delegation related to court closures and a thank you to Councillor McKenzie for leading that delegation. And our ask for that delegation was that there be um, adequate judicial resources allocated to ensure the efficient administration of justice. And at that delegation, the Attorney General um, advised that they were hiring approximately, I believe it was either 56 or 58 new justices of the peace, and that that should be happening in the near future. Uh, getting back now to the activities in corporate services for December, um, community risk assessment. Every municipality must complete a community risk assessment um, every five years, and the community risk assessment identifies, analyzes, evaluates, and prioritizes risks to public safety with regards to fire protection. So Perth County's GIS is supporting the lower tiers with regards to completing that assessment. I'm also happy to report that the renewal of our municipal insurance coverage has been completed. Archives has welcomed a high school student to complete a co-op placement. We're happy to support the community in that manner. Legislative Services is working to remediate our website to ensure that it complies with the province's accessibility requirements. And Perth County's Joint Accessibility Plan is being drafted and circulated internally and then to the lower, clerk, lower tier clerks and to the Joint Accessibility and Advisory Committee for review. Once completed, it will be circulated to all councils. So subject to any questions, that is my report. Okay, thank you. Any questions of the report? Seeing no questions, oh, Councilor McDermott. Um, uh, no questions, but I'd like to congratulate staff on the, uh, the bulletins that they put out. They were really well. And I was in uh, one with uh, Council McKenzie and did a very good job. Okay. Uh, just, okay. And any other questions? If not, we have a motion that Council receives the Corporate Services December 2023 update report for information. Moved by Councilor Kassenberg, second by Councilor McDermott. All in favor? Carried. Okay, now we're going to go to IT and GIS strategic plan progress update. And Steve is with us this morning. Do that. So welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Warden and members of council. 
Uh, this report provides an update on the progress made implementing the initiatives and recommendations identified in the 2022 IT and GIS strategic plan. The plan was developed in collaboration with Perry Group Consulting and presented to County Council in September of 2022. It identified several recommendations and strategic initiatives linked to specific projects and work to address gaps and opportunities. Some of the initiatives and recommendations addressed in 2023 include new cybersecurity improvements involving a new multi-factor authentication system for remote access, new mandatory cybersecurity training awareness for all staff, and a new mobile device management system. Several infrastructure projects that included upgrades to our internal phone system, our fleet of multifunction printing devices, and our backup system to improve our overall data security and business and GIS solution initiatives involving the selection of a new land and property management system, the GIS work required to get the new official plan project to council, and the development and publishing of a new Perth County roadmap available to the public both online and in print. Looking forward, the organization will continue to use the IT and GIS strategic plan as a guide to help determine the best way to utilize technology to provide the best services to our staff and residents. A few key initiatives identified for this year include working with facilities to plan, coordinate, and deliver all of the technology requirements for the five Huron building construction project. Completing all of the IT and GIS setup work required to roll out the new online land and property management system. And pending budget approval, addressing the current IT staffing resource challenges in order to meet the ever-increasing demand for new IT services and the need for enhanced cybersecurity measures to keep our networks and data safe. That concludes the report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions of the report? Seeing no questions, we have a motion that council receives the IT and GIS strategic plan progress update report. Moved by Deputy Warden Kellum, second by Councilor Trankowski. Favor? Carried. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move to budget. Corey's going to take the first thing on that. Welcome, Corey, and Corey Fields. <laughs> and Council. Um, process here is I'll be presenting an overview of the operating budget. Uh, throughout this overview, we'll get to the end uh, and then open up for questions from Council. Um, slide. Uh, the proposed amount to be collected through tax levy is currently uh, estimated at $22.2 million. Um, this represents a, an increase of about $2.4 million from the previous year, and it represents a 12.31 uh, increase from 2023. Uh, this increase has been created by greater than the municipal services with an increased pr pressure on housing, shelter, healthcare, and social services. This, along with maintaining uh, existing service levels uh, to our Perth County citizens. Uh, the 2024 budget includes about $72.2 million in total spending, uh, $55.2 million in operations, with the $17 million being in the capital. <laughs> Next slide. The format of the budget is, is identified here. Uh, we have non-departmental, which are not necessarily divisionally driven, uh, Office of the CAO, Corporate Services, Public Works, and uh, Paramedic Services. Each of the items within the budget binder are uh, providing a current year of the operating budget, which is, includes divisional accomplishments, priorities, and budget drivers. Uh, it includes also the financials providing 23 to 24 forecasts, as well as projected 2023. Next slide. 2024 proposed operating budget is uh, just over $18.4 million, or an increase of about 2.2 uh, from the 2023 approved budget. Uh, budget to operating budget to operating budget, that's a 13.7% increase from the previous year's approved budget. And it's 11.25% increase from the prior year's overall operating uh, approved budget. 2024 budget expenses are impacted by high inflation indexes and cost of living increases. These high levels of inflation will be seen over the next two budget cycles 
uh, budget cycles 2024 and 2025. The higher increases are being mitigated by departmental reviews and use of uh, reserves to maintain uh, existing service levels. Many of the internal divisions are seeing between six to 7% in their operational expenses. Uh, the county's cost shared services are seeing higher increases of approximately 15% related to long-term care and social services. Next slide. Council budget. Council budget contains the related expenses and activities for the council for the year. Uh, it includes salaries and benefits, professional development, and travel. Uh, council honorariums uh, meeting fees have increased by uh, uh, 2024 COLA, and the net levy impact is $18,000, or a 6.34%. Uh, the next is non-departmental. This contains revenues and expenses not attributed to any particular division. Uh, the items are listed there. Uh, the total net reduction in revenues and expenses for non-departmental is just over $200,000 or a 21% reduction in uh, previous year's revenues. Uh, the reduction is related to a uh, decrease in OMPF of $110,000 and exhausted modernization funding of approximately $120,000. Uh, Non-departmental also includes the recommended funding from levy stabilization reserve of 380,000 and working fund reserve of 200,000 for a total uh, uh, reserve transfer of $580,000. And 580,000 equivalent is about 3% to the levy. Uh, reserves allow municipalities to address uh, operating and capital requirements annually to achieve the strategic goals and support the asset management plan. Next slide. Grants. Uh, it's a new program developed in 2023 and it's currently be retained in 2024. The current budget forecast was kept at the current funding level of $10,000. Uh, 25,000 of this has been moved to the stewardship program and that was in relation to the tree planting, planting grant. grant and the stewardship program is located within the planning division. Next slide. Shared services. Uh, net levy impact for shared services is just over $800,000 or 13% increase. Uh, social services uh, here in Perth Public Health, Spruce Lodge and Stratford Perth Museum are all incorporated in, within shared services. And there you can identify and see the changes uh, 682,000 related to social services with 141,000 uh, being in Spruce Lodge. And those are both what I mentioned previously, a 15% increase. Uh, and the net levy impact being 13%. Um, the next slide. And finally, part of the non departmental is general insurance. Uh, this insurance increase is based on a 2023 uh, RFP, which was received from Aon Insurance and the increase was 7.38%, which is located within this operational budget. We'll move on to Office of the CIO, and I, I'm gonna highlight something as with the determination of what I was indicating with re respect to net levy impact and um, uh, percentage of expense increases. Uh, some divisions are, are in, Perth County are internal divisions and are distributed to external service divisions. Our internal divisions are CAO, HR, Legislative Services, Finance, IT, and the General Insurance Liability uh, Division. Uh, these divisions uh, will speak to the percentage of expense increase versus net levy impact, which net levy impact is the impact of increase to the increase in the overall levy of that essentially the $2.4 million that I speak to. Um, we'll highlight uh, CAO and corporate uh, communications first. Um, 2024 priorities in, in corporate service, or CAO, sorry, is the uh, corporate communication plan review, uh, the continued comprehensive policy review, uh, renegotiation major shared service uh, agreements, uh, renegotiation of regional roads agreement and the new facility operating process review. Uh, the percentage of, as an internal uh, uh, overhead division, the percentage of expense increase is $42,000 or an 11.58% increase. Next is the uh, human resources. Uh, human resources 2024 priorities are to focus on 
hard to fill recruit roles, including paramedics via student um, outreach, job fairs, and educational outreach, and to promote uh, employee engagement through updated policy and pra uh, practices reflecting current workplace trends. And the increase uh, percentage of the uh, expense increase is $24,000 or a 5.88% increase. Um, economic development and tourism is the next. Uh, the, the division expanding their existing programming through their tourism brochure, exper experiential tourism program, uh, discover more flavors and uh, with business retention and expansion by continuing to promote the workforce attraction and retention toolkits. Uh, they also are included, looking at investigating the sustainability of PC Connect transportation. The major initiative in uh, economic development tourism in 2024 is vital. Uh, the visitor data collection project, uh, collecting real-time domestic spending within Perth County over the 12-month period. Uh, this data will be will will be used to help better understand the market, help make informed decisions and set a baseline for future uh, measurements. Uh, the net levy impact is a, just over 100,000 or 14.21%. Uh, planning and development is next. Uh, the, in this area, the uh, net levy impact is uh, just under 350,000 or a 70.06% increase. Uh, the division has seen most significant uh, adjustment to maintaining service over the past couple of years with increased development opportunities within the limits of Perth County. Uh, this uh, includes the pre-approval from council of two additional planning resources, along with the inclusion of climate change uh, through the resiliency and stewardship coordinator. Uh, and through the increased resource, it includes $75,000 startup funding related to Perth County Stewardship Program. Uh, 2024 priorities are listed as updated official plan policy and zoning bylaw to address recent legislative changes uh, to complete the completion of the official plan and the resiliency and stewardship coordinator to develop a high level implementation strategy for greenhouse gas reduction and launch stewardship program. And along with that is the comprehensive zoning bylaw review for each lower tier municipality. The last item within office of the CAO is emergency management. Uh, the net levy impact is just over $10,000 or a 7.04% increase. And the, the priorities for uh, emergency management is the enhancement of the public education program beyond the minimum required by the province, exploring uh, potential partnerships with uh, uh, Perth County Paramedic Services and Municipal Fire Services and uh, community-based public education initiatives and development of a county crisis communication plan and development of a community continuity of operation program for business continuity to be rolled out to the county and municipalities. Next slide. The next uh, department within uh, the Corporation of the County of Perth is uh, Corporate Services. And the first one, we'll, which we'll, we'll highlight is legislative services. And within legislative services, percentage of uh, expense increase is just over $30,000 or 6.01%. Uh, the pro 2024 priorities are listed as accessibility to bring the county into compliance. An audit of the re uh, remediation of the uh, website will be completed. Uh, training will be provided to ensure website content remains accessible following the re re uh, remediation program, as well as reviewing the county's existing uh, accessibility uh, policies. Uh, records management is the continued onboarding compliance and missed divisions with, uh, with, a, with the goal of fully functioning records management program by the end of 2024. And then the last item is information access efficiencies and transparency. Uh, being the potential launch of file hold portal for more transparent public access of public records and the continued development of MTIPA program. Uh, the next uh, division is, is finance and the percentage of expense increase within finance is $66,000 or 9.89%. Uh, 2024 priorities are listed as completion of the uh, request for proposal for, pro for audit services policy development and review, uh, procurement and reserve and reserve funds, as well as asset obligation, retirement obligation, and the update of the uh, 
county's comprehensive asset management plan in conjunction with public works and also the advancement of uh, records management program. The next section is technology services. Uh, technology services 2024 priorities include, as Steve had previously mentioned in his presentation, <laughs> it's an upgrade several key uh, business systems, including corporate email, GIS, and application visualization uh, to complete the final design and setup of all technology systems for five uh, construct five year on construction, uh, including uh, data cabling, et cetera. Uh, and to deliver all remaining GIS data maps, online tools, and resulting updates to data layers required to complete the new official plan and to develop uh, the to and build new processes and GIS data structures for the use uh, in assets and emergency management programs used by the county in the lower tiers. Um, along with this, as you can see, the percentage of expense increases is 187,000 or 15.66%. Uh, in these priorities includes the assisting in uh, meeting the demand for the new systems and services is an additional staff resource required uh, an increase in the IT staff as supported by the 2022 and uh, GIS strategic plan, IT and strategic plan. Uh, the next item is court services. Uh, court services is self-funded through uh, collective fine revenue. Budgeted fine revenue is, is calculated using five-year averages. Uh, of fines collected, profits from the divisions are distributed to uh, Perth County Partners, Trafford St. Mary's, and the member municipalities. Uh, priorities within uh, court services is they continue with high level continue with high level service to the public and the judiciary, as well as addressing ongoing backing of cases and court closures. Uh, percentage of expense increase is set at sixty five thousand, or an increase of three point nine four percent. Uh, to note uh, the increase in core service profits, sort of the decrease in core service profits that are identified here. It's only been identified that 38,000 in profit will be seen in 2024 uh, proposed budget. And the last item for core services, <clears throat> sorry, core services, corporate services is Stratford Perth Archives. And the 2024 uh, priorities are a reference and research service. Uh, provide free online access to digitizing uh, newspaper, access advantages, disadvantages, and costs. establishing a, a virtual reading room uh, service for other collection in the future, and collection management and development. Uh, begin, begin arranging and uh, describing all of the county and Perth County administration archival records, <coughs> beginning with, uh, this is the beginning of a multi-year project, and then public outreach, expanding recognition program for donations of community records. Next slide. We'll move on to public works. Public works is broken down into <laughs> segments, all related to public works, uh, with administration being the number one. Uh, public works administration, uh, is seeing a $178,000 increase related to, um, uh, or a 10.35% increase to their expenses. This is significantly related to the internal divisions of overhead allocation to the PW administration, uh, with the remaining uh, increases being within salaries and benefits. Um, roads, uh, the next item that levy impact is 465,000 or 9.97%. Increases in roads is primarily due to rising winter maintenance costs, along with uh, depleted winter maintenance reserve, uh, depleted in 2022. Uh, increase in winter maintenance is $224,000. And uh, related to municipal drain assessments uh, within the general maintenance uh, program of the um, public works roads, which makes up a uh, majority of the 200. Uh, of the 465,000, 295,000 in relation to uh, the general program uh, and the reason of the essentially 10% increase within public works roads. Um, facilities, a facilities division serves all the county departments, council and tenants. Uh, other services internal and external are charged a rent to assist in the operation of the facilities along with the capital maintenance and repayment of debt. 2024, uh, we'll see a transition in the year from the removal of external tenants 
to allow the county to add to additional administration space uh, for the county staff with major projects of the courthouse connecting link. Um, the, again, percentage <coughs> increase of 45,000 or just 1.67%. Um, the last item within public works is fleet. Uh, fleet division ensures a preparedness for the public works operations and paramedic service response. Other services similar to facilities are charged rent for the use of the equipment. <laughs> rent and rates for other services have been increased due to the significant change in vehicle pricing to allow for funds to accumulate and to deal with future replacements. A percentage of a percentage in percentage of expense increase for 2024 is $158,000 or 5.63%. The last item is paramedic services. Uh, paramedic services is seeing a net levy impact of $240,000 or just a 6.13%. Um, the staffing increases within paramedics is set at 4.88 FTEs and broken down between 2.88 FTEs to relate to backfill for part-time paramedics in relation to increased um, uh, service calls. And then uh, two uh, paramedics uh, in relation to the community paramedics program. Uh, and this program is 100% funded through the uh, province currently to the March of 2026. The priorities within paramedics are public access defibrillator program renewal, uh, revitalize and expansion of the defibrillator program, uh, mobile integrated health strategy development. It, this is the development of a comprehensive strategic and operational plan to optimize age program and reach and impact. Uh, master plan development, collaborate with specialized consultants to devise a clear actionable growth strategy for P Perth County Paramedic Services over the next uh, five to 10 years, a patient satisfaction survey integration, uh, patient satisfaction surveys to refine service deliveries and enhance patient care uh, and technology integration, in incorporating innovative technology solutions like first watch for informed data-driven decision-making and hiring and retention. Uh, building a pathway program for students to become employees, engage and learn from paramedics to build a culture and welcome to all being the choice service to work for. In conclusion, um, 2024 is uh, a difficult year. We've seen a lot of accomplishments in 2023 and looking to all divisions accomplishments in 2024 as we proceed into this uh, high inflation uh, area that we are seeing currently. And I will close it there. And staff are here to potentially answer any questions that council may have. Okay, Council McCormick. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I would like to take the cultivating opportunities out of the budget. And I'd like to put the per seniors in our budget and for each. What page are you on? Where is so What page are you on? That would be under grants. Under grants and the well, page four one. Of the binder, that would be page ninety five. Okay, I'm going to repeat that again, what you said. I'd like to take the cultivating opportunities grants like that program in the budget. I'd like to put the list of seniors and 4-H in our budget. Okay, anyone else want to comment on that, Councillor Kassenberg? I just, I just want to make sure I understand your intention, uh, Councillor McDermott. You wish to defund Cultivating Opportunity Grant Program for 2024. Is that the intention? Okay, thank you. If, if I might, Warden, um, could I ask staff for consequences of that? If if we defunded that program, have we already gone through the motions of, uh, of um, securing uh, applications and all that kind of stuff and anticipating the commitment? 
Yeah, I, I can go on that. So, okay. so through the Warren, uh, we've completed the application process and uh, preliminary assessment at this time. Uh, grants haven't been awarded. Uh, that would be uh, coming to a future meeting um, of council. At this time, we have completed an assessment of the, the applications for the 2024 uh, Cultivating Opportunity Grant Community Stream. So, uh, but we haven't passed budget yet, right? So it can come up. But Th through the warden, that, that is correct. Uh, no decisions have been made upon the, the applications at this time. Dr. Aitchison? I think you report from Tyler this last, yeah, or whatever, on that cultivating opportunities. And it all applied. We knew who applied. They knew who met the qualification. We know who didn't. Yeah. And, you know, some of the ones didn't even come close to meeting the qualifications. Some of them didn't. I honestly think that at this point, if you want to pull the plug on the ones that applied and met all the qualifications, you're doing yourself a disservice. They've gone to all the work to get those applications in based on what we told them would be there for funding. Some of them didn't meet it. And I'm not going to name them out loud publicly because that's probably a closed session thing, but uh, we do that closed session too. I probably should have that discussion in closed session. Maybe. You know I me, mean? I'm not afraid to say it, but I got to be careful. Corey? Corey did that. Uh, so the, the current limit is, and this is the decision by council as well, the current limit is set at $10,000 for that program. Council can make it the decision to increase that program or decrease that program. So currently, I think the decision is to, I don't know, necessarily decrease it, but to just change it to a different area. So there could be a discussion on increasing the program to include the items that were suggested by Councillor McCarran. Mm -hmm. Councillor Tunkowski, do you want to comment? Question? Uh, through you, Warden. Um, just one second, just, sorry. Just give it a okay. second to catch up to you. Sure. All right. Now, no, through you, Warden, I was going to concur with Councillor McKenzie that. Um, this some of this discussion should be held in closed session. Okay. Anyone else? Or uh, through the warden, uh, stuff would agree with that. Just in terms of of the package of information, in terms of that overall program, um, you should go through that information first. And then if you want to close that program out, at least you would be able to make that as an informed um, group based on who submitted this year. And you could change the program if you'd like to at that time. We would adjust the budget as directed. Mm -hmm. Okay, Deputy Warden Kellum. Yes, through the warden. So if we wanted to add a line budget that may have some discussion in closed session, can we add it now or can we still add it after closed session? Uh, through the warden. Um, so what you have uh, in terms of a closed item that relates to specific financial information of other organizations and um, uh, the assessment of that information as it relates in, to a county program. So if you want to add money to a particular budget line in the budget, I would do that now. Or you could do that at a future meeting. It no. should be open. I can approve the budget today. No. 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 Deputy Warden Kelly. So, yes. So thank you for that. That's through yeah. the warden. Thanks for that. So I would like to add a line in the budget under grants for the delegation this morning for the North Coast seniors for the amount of $2,740. 2740 I believe the number was, correct? An increase. <clears throat> if, if an increase. If an increase of that to a total of? Um, so to the warden, they were asking for reinstatement, like earlier today, of 8,880. Yeah. For, for clarification. Well, through the warden, they said to me that their number was... They received twenty five hundred dollars for the year from last year. Mm -hmm. So they have a shortfall of twenty seven. Okay. 
So yeah. just the short. It's a time. just a short yes. fault for twenty-seven forty. Twenty-seven forty. Then they're about it. Yeah. Yeah. Give that to her. And the next year will be different. Okay. Yeah. So yes, two thousand seven hundred forty dollars, and I'll make that motion. <clears throat> Just for my own clarification, that's what they're short for 2023. What about 2024? I believe that is for 2024. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So do we need a motion to add that line? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you're moving to you're moving a motion to add that line that we add 2740 for the North First Seniors. Correct. And seconder, Dr. McDermott. Okay, questions, comments? Nope. Okay. All in favor of that motion? Opposed? Eric. Just a general comment. Sure. So I did read that package that Tyler sent out as to who applied. Some had certain things they were supposed to meet as fresh paper and didn't respond at all, period. And I'm not going to them in those sessions. I guess at some point, if you want to re-evaluate this program and how it works, then I think you have to have a bigger discussion. And that bigger discussion has to involve or evoke around people who are applying for money who have absolutely no way in the world they're going to survive unless they get grant money, grant money, grant money, grant money. And I see that's going to come to a huge end in the not so near future because of all the constraints with all the lower tiers, the upper tiers, provincial government, federal government. You're going to have people come into power just so that's it, funding gone. And you just can't keep supporting this. So we'll have a longer, broader range discussion. My opinion. Well, we'll discuss that a little further. Then. But I just want that brought up now because yeah. I'm not going to make the next meeting <clears throat> some medical procedures. So I uh, I want it I want to find it up today when I can. Okay, is there anything else, Councilor Gossenberg? Um, if I might, and, and kind of an awkward question, but I think it's a useful one. Um, can, um, between Mr. Bridges or, or um, Ms. Wolf, can you comment on whether um, the departments have been asked um, to identify things that they could remove from the budget if they were asked to do so? And, um, and whether we have a list to that end to evaluate whether there are some things that uh, we could tighten our belts on? Uh, through the warden. So uh, the management team has been asked to put forward a budget uh, that reflects um, their current service delivery review. Uh, they are well aware that if council says that this number is unacceptable, that we would return with a list. Uh, I don't have a list currently. Okay, Corey? No, no uh, I concur with uh, uh, CIO Wolf. Okay, Councillor Orr. Uh, Corey, I'm just wondering if you could let me know how much is in the levy stabilization fund and the working fund total. Yeah, so uh, with the anticipated use of this reserve uh, for 2024, it would bring the levy stabilization reserve fund to uh, just over $600,000. And the working fund uh, will, would retain about one point four million. So that is if we took this out. Correct. That's what they would be left with. You Correct. said one point four. Yes. <laughs> okay, Councilor Kassenberg. Um, to further on Councilor Orr's question, with regards to bringing the reserves down to those levels, do you feel that that's prudent? Uh, through the warden to Councillor Kaysenberg, uh, yes. Uh, in relation to um, the overall impacts to 
what we're seeing over the next couple of years. And again, I think we're going to be in a, a situation uh, within the budget for 2025 and 2026 where we have an exit strategy to uh, not utilize those reserves and still have money retained. Okay, Councilor Aitken. I don't like the tax increase any better than anybody else, but I was looking at this, I'm trying to get back to the page here with our overall total of reserves. I'm looking at it any like the county of Perth and correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, it's like six point some million dollars in reserve. Mm -hmm. That is peanuts. Literally peanuts. If you want to start depleting your reserve now, look at next year's projected increase is eleven point some percent. The year after that's eight or point something percent. You're gonna start cleaning up your reserves now. You're gonna turn into bad boy. No offense. I'm more I'm kind of a money numbers guy and I'm looking at this going, yeah, I hate this percent increase. And I know the staff have been told to reduce it down. I wasn't the word and I just I know they've been asked. I've talked to a couple of different ones. But you look at the price increase and everything going on right now. I'm looking at tracks of 440. You know, different things like you can't just not buy that stuff. You have to have good equipment. You have to have good staff. They have to be paid. But so you look at on this and you look at your overall increases, insurance, uh, shared services, the uh, $1.2 million increase <laughs> here. That's 6%. Really? So like, I don't know how you're going to solve it, but you just can't keep winding, winding down your reserves. My opinion. Councilor Kalsenberg? It, it begs one more thing. That is, um, given uh, forecasts for the next three to five year window, which I know are highly tentative and, and speculative, is there sort of an extinction point for the levy stabilization fund that uh, or reserve that, that we will see? Is there a point at which it's gone and we won't need it versus it's gone and now the taxpayer takes the hit? Uh, through the word to Council Kaysenberg, um, we're, we're reducing it to uh, the level to help mitigate the also the reduction in provincial transfers. Uh, but the exit strategy is there um, to see that $800,000 that we get from the um, Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund when it's finally is extinguished from uh, the county's revenues. Um, but the exit strategy, we, we're in a process that um, we're going to be fully utilizing essentially the prior year's reduction in OMPF uh, in 2025 and 26, et cetera essentially retaining a somewhat of a level in that uh, levy stabilization reserve. Okay, any other questions? No questions, okay. <clears throat> then we do have a motion that council receives a 2024 operating budget presentation. Second by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor Kassenberg. Any more questions? Councillor McKenzie? Well, I'm, it's not necessarily a question, it's more of a comment. You kind of skirted around it here this morning, but um, and I don't like doing this. I, normally, you do the questions and come in at a percentage, but um, could we ask staff, and I'm not sure this is a legal or right thing to do, but could we ask staff what the budget, what would come out of the budget to achieve, say, a 9% or pick a, pick a percentage that you think would be palatable with the rate pairs or the lower tiers? Um, we're at, uh, what would you say there, Corey, now? We're at, what, 13? 12. 12. 3 one. 3 one. okay. Um, you know, you can pick nine, you can pick 10. But I'm not saying that's what we want to end up at, but what would be the impact um, on our services if we hit that figure? That That's what I'm, I'm asking. And I don't know if we can do it or not, you know? 
I think council would have to be prepared to cut some services somewhere. Well, to yeah. achieve, but achieve what, a smaller I amount. What I'm saying is, yeah. what services would that impact? What would be the end result? Well, I guess if our staff does all that, I would like to know if council is willing to cut services. The staff go away and come back with mm -hmm. a list. We're going to have to decide in the end. No, I, I yeah. mean, I don't want staff, you know, turning away and spending hours on stuff if we're not interested in that. I just throw that out. Yes. It cost me. Mm -hmm. Maybe I missed it here, but overall, like we're showing projected annual on here on this budget, do you actually have a handle on what much from last year was? Was there any surplus? Uh, so based on a report that was brought to council, I think the uh, surplus was just uh, one hundred twenty thousand dollars on a on oh, half a percent. Yeah, levy. I don't want you get the final entries in. That's why I'm asking that question again. Right. Um, the only way you're going to cut that is to cut services. Let's be honest. Uh, no, there was a couple of questions. I was looking through different things, and I'm not picking or pointing fingers at anybody. So I'm looking at planning there once. We had a motion at our last meeting to take another look at planning service fees. And I noticed there was another, and I can't remember the number. There was a lot of numbers. There were 37 or something thousand dollars more coming out of the levy. So my big thing all along has always been the fee for doing those planning things has to be cost recovery. Is that something we need to look at sooner than later and not adjust the cost, but bump the cost? You can't always... There's other things that we could charge more for services to generate more revenue without, you're only gonna limit that to the number of people using the service. And if you want the service that bad, then you should be able to pay for it. So Castleberry? So um, <clears throat> just, just I, I don't wanna go down too deeply the rabbit hole that Councillor Aitchison raised. Uh, I think the purpose of the, planning um, fee request, which originated from Northport Council, was that there are some applications which are simple and straightforward and require a little bit of time. It's almost like there's a bimodal distribution in terms of time that's used. And, and we want to understand that distribution and whether we can have a sort of two-tier uh, pricing thing for official plan amendments, for example. So in response to that, um, but I think the point, the general point that I want to make is that um, not a whole lot of this spend is discretionary. And I think you were saying the same thing and saying, what services do you want cut, right? Um, there's much that we do that are under regulation mandate from, from other levels of government um, and, and not a lot of wiggle room there, right? Like I, I think the county, um, we can quite confidently say runs lean in a lot of places especially in mandatory and, and regulated services that we must provide. And so there really aren't that many departments or areas where there's discretion. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's easy to point at them. I'll point at one. And, and I certainly do the same thing in North Perth, as, as Deputy Mayor and, and Deputy Warden Callum say. Um, you know, you can point at economic development, say that's a discretionary area if you want to. But do we want to compromise our services there or change our service level and activity level there? Um, that's a question for council to consider. There are probably a few other discretionary areas, uh, but they're not many. They're probably countable on one hand is my guess. And so, um, you know, when you look at, at this, the number feels unpleasant, um, but there are unpleasant numbers going on all around us. And uh, we continue to see downloads from the province uh, to us. Um, that require us to respond or, or act in, often largely in the interest of the community where, where we see people who are experiencing discomfort or pain or frustration and, and we act to fill a void that's been created in some cases by other levels of government. So to me, I guess my argument is, um, um, even though I started by asking the question, um, I, I don't honestly believe that there's lots of areas for 
um, cost cutting and, and service reduction here because so much of that pie is mandated by other levels of government. Okay, um, you wanna to respond to that or I have Dean on You can go ahead. We have Councilor Trunkowski. <clears throat> Through you, Warden. Um, Councillor Kaysenberg touched on some of the points that I was going to raise. Um, mandatory special, mandatory spending versus discretionary spending, and an overview of uh, uh, Mr. Bridges' report. The double digit increases, um, like shared services, um, significant increase in planning significant increases in public works. Those are core services. Um, if if we were to cut cut in those areas, that would be a, to the detriment of the well-being of the county and the lower tiers. And further to Councillor Kaysenberg's comments about economic development, um, the money spent there plant the seed for future growth opportunities and i.e. future revenue opp opportunities for both the county and the lower tiers. And I think we would be uh, very remiss if we uh, if we uh, took away money from the economic development uh, program and all uh, our department in all its forms because uh, that's what uh, it plants the seeds for uh, future growth uh, uh, in our communities. Um, so those are I I mentioned in previous meetings uh, was, we're talking about planning, but I mentioned uh, becoming the victims of our own success. And this is the kind of thing that I was uh, referring to. Um, if we want to, if we want our community to grow and get better, we have to make the necessary investments now in order to secure our economic future later on. And uh, yes, it's tough to make these levy requests, but it's for the future benefit of future generations is my comment. Thanks. Mr. Richardson? I'm just going to concur uh, a little bit to what Councillor uh, Ian Cope just said there. It technically, economic development would be a discretionary. That's the last place you want to cut. I started on county council. You didn't even have an economic development department. And that wasn't that many years ago. And how I've seen that grow and develop and bring us in more opportunities, not just as, you know, the, the towns like Lissau or, or wherever, but like even the... Uh, for the farmers, like secondary farm businesses and all kinds of things, they're the ones that have really brought that to the forehead. That would be the last place you would want to cut. You just, that's like cutting off your hand. To, you know, you're, you're going to have nothing feeding you in the future. But that's not just my opinion, but uh, like it's it's a bad number. But there's bad numbers all around us. And I think it was... It, Councillor Katzenberg or somebody made the comment about more downloading, or maybe it was Councillor Trinkowski. What I've been reading lately, there's going to be a significant more amount of downloading on here in the very near future. So you may think it's bad now, and they're showing 11 something for next year. That could become an 18 if the downloading continues. Maybe we should apply to the provincial government as broke, like the city of Toronto, get them to cover all the roads that we're maintaining that they downloaded to us. Like I'll take 86 and 119, and like those were all looked after by the province at one time. We're the ones paying for that now. So through the warden for council, the budget that staff development put before you is what we believe meets your strategic plan and your priorities. And um, they're well aware that if there was something they could, you know, not do this year and they could do next year, uh, they looked at that. They considered that in terms of the health of their programs and services based on what's mandatory for the regulatory piece and what they need to develop their program. IT is a very good example. So we committed to you. We return once a year and tell you what we're doing with that strategic plan so you can see that we are following your direction that those investments are made. Um, you know, those ones aren't, aren't uh, inexpensive. So all municipalities have a continuum of service. And we could easily outline that for you. Um, and council has uh, hit the nail on the head. There is mandated services where you have no discretion. And then along the continuum, uh, the other side, you do have discretionary spending. 
Um, I'm happy to have the staff work and come back and bring you something that says, here's where we would recommend if you decide you want a different number, um, but there would be impact. We wouldn't be advancing your strategic plan. It would be in the discretionary areas because that's the only area that we have. And as an upper tier, it's different because we don't run the same level of programs at the local level. We don't run recreation and, and parks and other areas, uh, floral programs and things like that, where you would see other municipalities perhaps saying, okay, we're reducing, for example, uh, the park plantings to 50%. Most municipalities have already gone that route and they've, they've cut, cut, cut to that degree. But um, we are always uh, willing to bring council additional information so that you feel you are informed when you're making these decisions. And, uh, but that continuum of service, that's how that would come back to you, showing you what is mandated, which I know you already know because you've just had your budget presentation. There is only a few things that we really do. Um, and then we would be reaching down into areas like professional development and training um, across the board. And that doesn't um, develop the staff to a level that we're able to provide the uh, quality of service that, um, you're accustomed to and that we want to provide. The planning fees, we are looking at those because there actually are a few other types of applications that we don't charge for. That report's already coming back. We will add the information uh, that was requested at the last meeting to that particular report so council can see it. But we've even approached the province about adding new services. An example would be, um, can we um, issue marriage licenses at the upper tier? We have a good location. We've got a park outside. Here's a way we can generate a bit of money. Um, and um, it's not within our sphere of jurisdiction without permission. And the answer was no. So we do look for that. Um, you know, if, if I thought we could cut in some of those discretionary um, areas, that would already be before you. And so what's really the, the, the budget is what we believe we need to operate this year. Okay, hey, Deputy Warden Kellum. Yes, through the warden. And thank you, Lori. That is exactly the answer that I was looking okay. for to make me uh, more comfortable making the decision. I'm pretty sure that our senior staff uh, yes. have already did this and they're not, they're making common sense decisions. Uh, I don't want to cut services. Uh, I don't want to go backwards. I want to move forward. So I am comfortable with this number. Thank you. So through the warden, it's just, I just don't have a list for you, but. What we need to do is open up a casino. <laughs> I, I say that kind of you know offhanded, but every municipality has got a casino, and they don't seem to have a problem with revenue. I suggested that in Perthes a long time ago. <laughs> well, every every minute you're watching a sporting event or something on TV, you're getting the sub three uh, gambling. Right? He's on the boards or on baskets or on the screen or whatever. That'll be your next uh, big spend in the near future. Mr. Kassenberg? I think I would like to move that uh, we uh, have the resolution on the floor. and, and We have a motion on the floor, in fact, that says council receives a 2024 operating budget presentation. Do you have a motion? Questions. Okay. It has been moved and seconded, right? Correct. So... You're not approving, you're just receiving. You're just receiving, you're receiving the budget. All in favor? <clears throat> Carried. Okay. We do the marriage certificate. We do the first out. Do local level. Well, council, we're moving on now to council reports. Do we have any council reports? We have bylaws at bylaw 3960-2024. Read a first, second, third time, finally passed this 25th day of January 2024. Read a seconder, moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor Orr. All in favor? Carried. Is there any notice of motions? Any other business? Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Any announcements? If not, we do need a closed session so that First County Council move into closed session at approximately 11.51 a.m. in accordance with Section 239 of the Municipal Act 
S.O.2001 C.25 to consider a matter pertaining to information supplied in confidence by a third party. It's under legislative services. We need a mover and a seconder to do that. Moved by Officer Orr, second by Councillor Trinkowski. All those in favor? Thanks, everyone else. Thank you for the rest of your day. We do have a bylaw, bylaw 3959-2024, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of Council of the Corporation of the County of Perth at its regular meeting held January 25, 2024, is read a first, second, and third time and finally passed January 25, 2024. Mover and a seconder, moved by Matt, second by Dean, Dean all in favor, carried, and Council meeting be adjourned at approximately 12.45. Moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor Kassenberg. All in favor? Carried. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you. Enjoy the rest of your day.